Ancient mythology, the breeding ground of many a present day story. From paperback fiction to widescreen cinema, the myths of our ancestors have inspired everything from depression era dramedy to rather more literal translations. In 2016, it was Egyptian mythology's turn to try and light up the box office, as Lionsgate bet on a hopeful new franchise with Alex Proyas's Gods of Egypt. The movie saw a somewhat whitewashed cast playing Egyptian deities, with Nicola Costa Valdo as Horus and Gerard Butler as Set, going 10 rounds to determine the fate of the flat earth. Seriously, the earth is flat in the movie. With a $140 million budget and a visionary director like Proyas at the helm, Lionsgate rolled the dice. An original take on myths and stories that have existed for a few thousand years, from the man responsible for Dark City and the Crow, it seems like a pretty safe bet that audiences would be getting something that at the very least was visually dynamic. Alas, it was not meant to be. From shoddy CGI to casting controversies, Gods of Egypt proved to be one of the biggest box office bombs of 2016, if not the whole decade. Why then did a movie with this much creative originality with a multi-million dollar budget fall so far from grace? Put on your golden winged armor and place that heart in a jar with Joe Blow as we find out what the f happened to this movie. In May 2012, Alex Proyas was announced as directing Lionsgate and Summit Entertainment's Gods of Egypt. He was also due to provide assistance on writing the script alongside Matt Sazama and Burke Sharpless. If you don't recognize the names, they're the duo responsible for the scripts of Dracula Untold, The Witch Hunter, the big screen Power Rangers adaptation a few years ago, and more recently, Morbius. 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 Yes. Morbius. Morbius remains at large. Proyas was familiar with working with the pair, or at least rewriting their works, as he did some work on Dracula Untold back when it was known as Dracula Year Zero, although the final product is not something he recognizes. <laughs> Having recently worked on the Nick Cage sci-fi picture Knowing with Summit several years ago, the studio was obviously happy to work with Proyas again. Producer Basil Avinik became involved with his Thunder Road Productions banner at the same time. Obviously a fan of Sword and Sandals, he's also partly responsible for Seventh Son with Jeff Bridges and the Clash of the Titans remake with Sam Worthington. Proyas was attracted to the project as an antidote to the existing IP of big budget franchise fare. Posting on Facebook, he said, quote, I could be wrong, but I think Gods of Egypt is one of the very few original large budget studio movies. Such a sad state of affairs. Is this really what audiences want these days? Every movie to be tied into some other movie? So everyone knows exactly what they are getting before they step into the cinema? Just like going to McDonald's anywhere in the world and the burgers always taste exactly the same. It's all about the greater good. The greater good. A little cynical perhaps, but an understandable viewpoint. The greater good. He's quoted as naming Lawrence of Arabia, The Guns of Navarone, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the works of Sergio Leone as influences on Gods of Egypt. Lofty aspirations indeed. I don't want to die, I want to live forever. Lionsgate, meanwhile, were hoping for a successor to the Hunger Games franchise, which released its first installment in 2015. They were also happy to take the tax breaks from shooting Gods of Egypt in Australia, supposedly severely reducing the amount of financial risk they were absorbing. More on that later. With production slated for 2014, casting could begin, and Proyas has been very frank about his desire for a multinational cast, as well as the need to balance this approach with A, casting box office straws to appease investors, okay, now, now you're speaking my language, and B, casting Australian actors in order to be eligible for certain Australian financial incentives and the ability to shoot there. Oh, you're speaking my language. To hear Proyas explain it, He's an Egyptian-born man of Greek heritage, and the Egypt he knows and loves quote, multicultural crossroads of civilization, culturally and racially. He described Gods of Egypt as a work of the imagination, and therefore he felt free to populate the cast with actors from many different ethnic backgrounds, at least to a certain extent, in light of the restrictions he's been open about discussing. Later lamenting the lack of quote, a perfect world where there are a greater pool of English-speaking Egyptian actors to draw upon for this movie, 
Proyas instead went with Gerard Butler as his main draw. We need a muscular man role. I'm talking muscles on muscles. Cast as the Egyptian god of darkness, Set, as well as Game of Thrones' Nicola Costafaldo as Horus, god of the sky. While the plot was understood early on to be a battle between the two, the third main role was that of a human thief who joins Horus on an adventure. This role, Beck, went to young Aussie actor Brendan Thwaites, who at the time was most well known in Hollywood for a role in Maleficent and a quality performance in the solid Aussie thriller Son of a Gun. With these three roles of ancient Egyptian gods and the mortal in between them filled by Caucasian actors, it's easy to see why folks balked at the casting. Even with French-Cambodian actress Elodie Young, African-American actor Chadwick Boseman, and Courtney Eaton, an Australian actress of Chinese and Maori descent, the movie was considered heavily whitewashed, which would later lead to an apology from both Proyas and the studio. Regardless, pre-production moved forward with little regard to any future casting backlash, if it was predicted at all. And by early 2014, the cast was in place, with Jeffrey Rush rounding out the team playing Ra, God of the Sun. 200 crew members were starting to put the movie together in Sydney, with the eventual production being earmarked for New South Wales and an April 2014 start. New South Wales deputy premier, Andrew Stoner, estimated that the production would bring 400 jobs and a $75 million injection into the local economy. It's easy to forget that for every movie that ultimately bombs, they still create jobs and contribute financially to the places where they're filmed, which in and of itself is a great thing. Principal photography ended up beginning in March at Fox Studios Australia in Sydney, with an estimated production budget of $140 million. The CEO of Lionsgate, John Feltheimer, would go on to say that Lionsgate's financial exposure was actually under $10 million thanks to the tax incentives from filming in Australia. Foreign pre-sales also greatly helped reduce the exposure of Lionsgate's bottom line. The shoot apparently went well, with no real setbacks or challenges other than the fun techniques that Proyas was implementing. The gods of gods of Egypt are all 9 feet tall, which required the use of forced perspective and motion control photography when said gods were sharing the screen with mere mortals. Proyas described the process as a reverse hobbit as the hobbits in The Lord of the Rings were made to look smaller than their human, elvish, or dwarfish co-stars. He also described it as, quote, a complete pain in the arse. It is at least a comfort for those who empathize with Proyas' play as director that this was the biggest challenge when shooting Gods of Egypt. Proyas was happy with the result, calling them, quote, pretty spectacular. But that's up to the audiences to determine whether they agree or not. You don't like me cooking? Composer Marco Beltrami was brought in to provide the score, having collaborated with Proyas on iRobot and Knowing. The director asked Beltrami to provide a score similar to Lawrence of Arabia and felt satisfied at the final score, calling it a, quote, good old fashioned thematic score. You can leave the theater humming. Oh, yeah! Come post production, Proyas had an original cut that was over three hours long due to the epic scope and nature of the story. While Proyas said it worked really well, he was also frank about the fact that the runtime had to be shortened, not just to match the studio and audience expectations, but because an extra hour of visual effects would be considerably more expensive. The budget was already high for an original motion picture, and the studios are probably glad they didn't fork over more cash for a longer runtime and more VFX, considering how the movie was eventually received. It's hard to say whether a three hour version of Gods of Egypt would have been better than the theatrical cut. While the existing movie ultimately turned out to be an economical story with fairly thin characters, perhaps there would have been more of the opportunity to go in depth across the board, given more time. We'll never know for sure, as a director's cut looks highly unlikely at this point. Even though Proyas would have been game to show a two hour and 45 minute cut that quote, absolutely rocked, even with unfinished visual effects. For fans of Gods of Egypt, they'll sadly never see it, as far as we can tell. Aww, for the love of crud. Ultimately, Gods of Egypt clocked in at two hours and seven minutes, with visual effects that are a little on the shoddy side. The story of Set and Horus' struggle for control of Egypt, with young Beck caught in the middle, trying to ensure his beloved Zaya's passage to the afterlife, makes for a simplistic story of good versus evil. 
The film digs lightly into the theme of man's relationship with the gods, and vice versa, with Horace slowly discovering his purpose and finding mutual respect with Beck. As the film geared up for its promotional tour, attention soon turned to the overwhelming whiteness of the cast of a movie titled Gods of Egypt. The first incendiary pieces were released around the time of production, led by author Ruby Hamad, who wrote that, quote, the time-honored tradition of Hollywood whitewashing continues. Timing-wise, this was coming off the back of Russell Crowe as Noah, as in, you know, the guy with the boat, and Christian Bale as Moses in Exodus Gods and Kings. Director Ridley Scott had previously defended that casting, arguing that he needed big box office names like Bale and Joel Edgerton to make the movie. That argument might hold sway for some when it comes to an Oscar-winning name like Bale, but less so when we're discussing Gerard Butler, even though that would be in the eye of the beholder, or the financier. Things worsened when the character posters for Gods of Egypt dropped. The Washington Post delivered a scathing article in November 2015, collecting a wide range of opinions from social media, including accusations of Chadwick Boseman's character enforcing the, quote, magical Negro stereotype, as well as the one blue tick Twitter account starting the hashtag, all white gods matter, while sharing the posters of the movie's white characters. The article also mentioned that Aziz Ansari's recent Netflix show, Master of None, had brought the matter of diverse, or the lack thereof, casting front and center, implying that Gods of Egypt was coming along at the wrong time. The Fuhrer prompted both Proyas and Lionsgate to issue an official apology in the same month, although to many it was considered too little, too late, and somewhat ingenuine, considering it should have clearly been apparent to both from the start. Proyas said, quote, the process of casting a movie has many complicated variables, but it is clear that our casting choices should have been more diverse. I sincerely apologize to those who are offended by the decisions we made. Lionsgate followed up with more typical PR verbiage. Quote, we recognize that it is our responsibility to help ensure that casting decisions reflect the diversity and culture of the time periods portrayed. In this instance, we failed to live up to our own standards of sensitivity and diversity, for which we sincerely apologize. Lionsgate is deeply committed to making films that reflect the diversity of our audiences. We have, can, and will continue to do better. Both made the kind of apology that was never received from Ridley Scott for Exodus, Gods, and Kings, or even Joe Wright for casting Rooney Mara as Tiger Lily in the Peter Pan prequel, Pan. Proyas later walked back his apology somewhat, making the following statement on his Facebook page. Quote, It is common for actors to play a character of a different nationality to their own. Sean Connery, a Scot, played a Russian. Omar Sharif, an Egyptian, also played a Russian. Meryl Streep played an Australian. Anthony Quinn, a Mexican, played almost anybody ethnic. And every Australian actor puts on an American accent now and then and pretends to be a Yank. America! Woo! He also went on to explain the limitations placed on casting by virtue of the production's financial needs, as previously mentioned. Nicola Costavaldo would come to the defense of the movie in February 2016, arguing that he was playing, quote, an eight-foot-tall god who turns into a falcon and not an Egyptian, meaning that, quote, you can't win in that sort of discussion. He also later argued that, quote, if the film had been called Gods at War, it would have been more appropriate, and we would not be having this conversation. Gerard Butler also spoke out, saying that the backlash was too much. Quote, I understand the movement generally, but you consider our movie? One of our leads was based on an Egyptian god who was not black. We had Ethiopians in the film. We had Egyptians in the film. We had all different actors from all over the place that was never really... They were from everywhere. So I thought that was a little too much to try and damage a movie like that. I disagree. The late, great Chadwick Boseman actually agreed with the critics of Gods of Egypt's whitewashed cast, saying that was exactly why he signed on to the project. Quote, When I originally was approached with the script, I thought this critique might come up. I really did. And I'm thankful that it did. Because actually, I agree with it. That's why I wanted to do it. So you would see someone of African descent playing Toth, the father of mathematics, astronomy, the god of wisdom. Whether you believe and accept the apology from Proyas and Lionsgate, or agree with the criticism, or stand by Coaster Valdo's and Butler's defense, the movie went ahead with its release with no other concern from the cast and how they were being perceived. There will be only one course of action open. Total commitment. This led to a dismal $14 million domestic opening, after which Gods of Egypt puttered along to a 31 domestic total, and 150 worldwide. Take the money bag away, I don't need that many. 
off the back of that previously mentioned $140 million budget, plus a supposed $30 million for the advertising. Even with the increased ticket prices for 3D screenings at the time, a gimmick still hot at the time of release, nothing could have saved Gods of Egypt from turning out to be one of the biggest cinematic failures of the year. At least Lionsgate were protected from financial risk by 46% of their budget being covered by Australian tax incentives. It's all about the greater good. The greater good. And the rest of pre-sales. Critically, Gods of Egypt obviously didn't fare much better either. The mythical epic currently sits at a horrifically low 15% rotten rating on Rotten Tomatoes, with audiences being barely a shade kinder, providing a 37% aggregate. Empire Magazine said in their review, quote, It's a film that reeks of money, big swooping shots stretching on for digitally created miles and golden costumes glinting, but it's money badly spent. All the effects look like they missed the final pass, shiny with that glossy mid-90s artificiality. It brings to mind the Dolly Parton line, It cost me a lot of money to look this cheap. This is the Dolly Parton of movies, without any of the knowing wit. Yikes. Oh boy. The AV Club also claimed that Gods of Egypt, quote, seems to be introducing so many fantastical elements and baffling characters that it verges on becoming Proyas' Jupiter Ascending. Rotten Tomatoes summed up the entire critical reception by saying, quote, look on Gods of Egypt, ye filmgoers, and despair. Joe Blow's own Chris Bumbray called it, quote, empty spectacle, which goes a long way to describing the finished product. Judging from the box office, it seemed audiences agreed. Oh, yeah! Gods of Egypt ended up being a big showy spectacle with weak visual effects, weak performances, and a flimsy script that maybe looked better in Proyas' imagination than it ever could on celluloid. Oh boy. The whitewashing controversy severely hampered its public image in the run-up to its release, perhaps deservedly so. The movie will remain a curiosity that drifts from streamer to streamer, perhaps best enjoyed on a hangover by people who either don't care or don't know about its casting misfires. So it goes. Oh yeah! One of the most exciting things about the film is to be with a group of world-class artists, literally from around the world. We're using a truly international cast. It's a weird tone, like, you know, it's like, it's a good tone, um, but I didn't expect it to be as funny as it is. So I'm, I'm happy that I did it. Because the story is so strong and so grounded and the characters are so real, you're with them on this journey. And if you have that, it's gold because you can go anywhere. In the hands of a black like Alex, it has a real good chance of being pulled off. I feel very lucky to be a part of that. Oh boy. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments and thanks for watching.